Let's start with a disclaimer. This video brings you only a short insight on the nuances of spatial design, focusing on the aesthetic and performative dimensions, values and ethics. However, I will explain some important notions of spatial design in relation to nature-based solutions that will allow you to propose and integrate nature-based solutions into a site-specific context. Two important notions are space and place, which will be discussed in this video. From a landscape ecology point of view, a landscape can be considered as a mosaic of different elements fitting together. In general, we can distinguish two types of elements, corridors and patches. Corridors are linear elements like rivers or highways, but in this video, the focus mainly lies with patches as it is strongly related to the notion of space. Patches are areas with a homogeneous land use type, a patch of grass, a patch of agricultural field, a patch of high density build up area, or a patch of park. All the spaces you can recognize having a distinctive type of land use. The reason we look at patches is because we are looking for available spaces within the fused areas and their potential to retrofit and receive further green and blue elements. The potential of transformation and integration of nature-based solutions is highest at, the, for instance, abundant sites or open spaces. In most cases, this potential of change is related to the density of buildings. The lower the density, the more space available and the higher the potential. When implementing nature-based solutions, we are putting all ground space, public space, open space and vacant space into function. We operationalize them to transit from traditional ways of managing flows with monofunctional gray structures to the multifunctionality of design based on natural principles. In this way, these spaces can contribute as, for instance, alleviation of excess of water, improvement of microclimate, enhancing evapotranspiration, a reduction of air pollution, sound pollution, or temperatures. The notion of space, the spatial dimension is therefore, on the one hand, performative, as it focuses on managing flows in close collaboration with the existing infrastructures, using the voids, the void spaces of the environment. On the other hand, the dimension of space can enhance the living environment, enhance spatial quality and social cohesion, as it can provide places for encounter, which are, for instance, more secure or more inviting. The exposure of the performative aspect by exposing the flows, which are usually hidden and in attractive and qualitative way by, for example, landscaping streets or small in-between spaces in the dense built environment, also helps for the appropriation of space and it's capable of increasing awareness and responsibility. A simple example is an engineered monofunctional underground sewage pipe which discharges rainwater out of our site from a paved street. A way of exposing this flow and making space performative is by replacing the sewage pipe with a so-called bioswale. With a bioswale, the discharging of water is brought back to the surface. In this way, it shows the quantity of water which was accumulated after a rain event in a quantitative manner with green space. Besides showing the performative aspect, the green space also makes natural infiltration possible, which relieves the pressure of the piped system and in dry periods, it improves the outdoor comfort. Just like this bioswale, there are many examples of how spatial design that works with natural processes can actually improve space, both from a management of flow point of view and from a qualitative point of view. However, designing with space is something completely different from designing with place. Space is not specific where our place is. A place is a specific point in space which holds information. The first bit of crucial information is, of course, where we are. Where are we? Therefore, we first look at our latitude. Latitude looks into north and south for the position on Earth relative to the equator and the climate conditions related to latitude. It's a completely different thing to design for regions with cold climate compared to designing in warm regions, especially when designing with nature-based principles which are very much dependent on climatic and atmospheric conditions like temperature, precipitation, but also dependent on how these conditions might change 
with the seasons, for instance, with succession and climate change projections for the longer term. After the latitude, we look into altitude, both in a relative and in an absolute way. For our absolute altitude, I need to explain you about catchments. Every elevation ridge defines a catchment. A raindrop that falls on one side of the ridge flows into the catchment on the right, and a raindrop falling on the other side of flows to the left part of the catchment. And in this way, the whole world is divided into catchments. I'm currently staying in Delft, where we are part of the catchment area of the Rhine River. But even within the catchment there, are big differences to be recognized as it runs from upstream in the mountains via the middle stream to downstream. Secondly, there is an absolute altitude, which is the number of meters you are located above or maybe even below general mean sea level. From latitude and altitude, we can go down to the materialization of your location. Starting with the surface, what is your direct environment covered with? Is the land mostly paved? and is the soil closed off, or is there is plenty of open ground? The land cover is often related to land use, which is strongly influenced the permeability of the surface. For the permeability, we look at the surfaces that allow water to naturally infiltrate into the ground. When your surrounding is full of buildings, the rain falls on roofs and streets, discharging the rain via rain pipes and gutters to the sewage system underground. In the case where streets are covered with bricks or gravel, there is a possibility for water to at least partially natural drain into the ground. Patches of green and grass, soccer fields and other types of open ground allow rain, rain water to fully drain to the subsurface when well maintained. Right below the surface we find the subsurface, which can be sub, uh, subdivided into topsoil and soil. The conditions of the surface influence the topsoil. It can be polluted by infiltration of contaminated water in industrial or urban areas, irradiated by monoculture, or it could actually be in good conditions for veg veg vegetation to growth. The soil, further below, tells us more about the geological conditions of the site. This information can show us how the soil has been affected by its use, cover and formation, both from a structural point of view in terms of its sensitivity to, for instance, subsidence or landslides, but also from a quantitative point of view in terms of contamination by industrialization or urbanization. In the end, the soil is the medium by which things are transformed, and it's what it will hold the green and blue elements in the end. Everything comes from the soil. All these layers of information together allow us to read the patch three-dimensionally. The horizontal dimension show us the potential to retrofit green and blue within space. The vertical dimension is the performative dimension and tells you what exactly you are retrofitting and sets the performative objective. It is within the vertical dimension, this section, that spatial design is so important. You can make sections of anything, seas, mountains, cities, buildings and streets. The section is one of the main forms of design communication which in this context makes it possible to visualize the site-specific relation between the atmosphere, the surface and the subsurface layers and the amount and type of space that is available above and below ground.